Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Rowe, President and Chief Executive Officer, Northwestern Energy. Quadrennial review, I think, is a, an ideal way to uh, tie things together before we bring all of uh, the panelists back on for one uh, final lightning round. Uh, great day. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed that I think almost everyone has stayed. I think the only people who left during the break uh, were the ones who saw the uh, uh, name of the program, Next Generation, and had come to get an autograph from Spock or Captain Kirk. Uh, but the rest of us are, in fact, uh, a different kind of nerd than that. Uh, uh, a couple of highlights, and I think you all have your own uh, key takeaways here, but some of the themes that uh, certainly sounded to me, uh, the pace of innovation, the excitement around innovation. We heard, we heard uh, real enthusiasm uh, from Heather at the start right through to the uh, regulators at the end. Uh, the changing uh, makeup of the, uh, of, of the, of the, the fleet, uh, the fuel mixture, uh, and also kind of the changing configuration of the grid potentially over time. This isn't a perfect uh, analogy with power flows, but you can think of it a little bit like the transition of the telecommunications network from, or, or other networks, cable network, from uh, point to multipoint, uh, transitioning potentially from multipoint to multipoint. And that's an awful lot more complicated, and that takes an awful lot of investment uh, even to support uh, that kind of network. Uh, digitization, uh, again, IP uh, meets uh, uh, EP. Uh, uh, the, the challenge to get close to the customer, and I uh, have for years put down my foot whenever anyone used the word ratepayer as opposed to uh, customer, uh, and particularly understanding the differentiation between uh, our customers and, and different expectations of customers. Uh, uh, questions about, again, efficiency, and I was actually very pleased that the uh, conversation gravitated back towards efficiency. One of my concerns often is that we step over dollars uh, to pick up dimes, and efficiency is still a compelling resource. Interestingly, and I think the regulators did a nice job capturing this, a lot of the same kinds of policies that need to be in place uh, to support uh, investment in modernization, investment in smart grid, are essentially the same policies uh, that need to be in place to support uh, either utility or non-utility efficiency programs. So that that was a great place to, uh, to really end the regulatory discussion. Uh, you can think about this as a bit uh, of an iron triangle or at least some kind of a maybe more benign triangle uh, with technology, uh, public policy, uh, whether legislative or regulatory, uh, and the business model. Uh, and those all have to be in harmony uh, what was encouraging, I thought, was at the center of that triangle, uh, in fact, was the customer. And, and in every panel, the discussion did come back to the customer, engaging with the customer, the question of uh, who and on, uh, on what terms uh, that engagement would take place. So again, a, a tremendous amount of value uh, throughout the day. I would ask uh, all of our panelists who are still with us uh, to come back up. This will be very, very interesting uh, to do. I'm going to, in fact, kind of move off to the side here a little bit uh, so that we can uh, see everyone. Uh, uh, Michael uh, mentioned that uh, in uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, dog days of August uh, in Nevada, uh, it may be 115 degrees, but it's a dry 115 degrees. Uh, where I live, I've been spending the last actually several months back to December uh, saying, well, it may be 30 degrees below zero. Uh, but it's a really dry 30 degrees <laughs> below zero. In either case, whether it's 115 in the summer or 30 below in the winter, uh, ultimately what all of this does come down to uh, is the infrastructure and the service uh, and the customers and particularly uh, the utility uh, professionals who are out in the field under incredibly difficult uh, conditions, whether uh, too hot in the summer, or blizzard in the winter, uh, any time of day, uh, making sure that customers uh, stay in power or restored to power and, and ultimately making sure that uh, both uh, the employees and the customers are safe. And I think that's, that really ought to be uh, the, the place that we uh, start and finish the focus. So what I'd like to do here, uh, I, I know enough about this cast of characters that probably every one of them was jumping out of their seat uh, during the other panel because they wanted to get in on that bit of the discussion too. So uh, I, my expectation is that I can kind of fade into the background here, uh, toss a couple of topics up, and, uh, and then just sort of watch the uh, feeding frenzy as they all go after it. <laughs> so the first question, uh, and a, again, tremendous uh, discussion of uh, regulatory issues in, in the last uh, panel, and a lot of enthusiasm about 
uh, the regulatory projects as well. So uh, we, we all agree technology is changing uh, dramatically. And uh, some of us, in fact, I was a regulator when telecommunications uh, went through its change. And I apologize terribly. Uh, <laughs> but it, it wasn't a smooth process. And uh, in fact, I think it's fair to say that regulation really was hard pressed to keep up with the pace of change in that sector. And interestingly, uh, I was on what was called the Federal State Universal Service Joint Board uh, many years ago, and that same joint board is now struggling with basically the same set of issues uh, and much more challenged, I, I, I would suspect. So uh, uh, we, we didn't maybe do as, as good a job as we could keeping up uh, there. So uh, what technologies are you most interested in? And again, not just speaking to those of you from the technology companies, but uh, to the regulators uh, and to the utilities as well. What, uh, what technologies are you most interested in that might uh, fundamentally upset the apple cart, change things in good ways, bad ways, or at the very least, ways that we don't see? Uh, and then uh, how do we, whether from the utilities or from the, the public side, keep up with it? So you need you know, somebody to start. Ah. <laughs> I like saying that too, by the way. It's <laughs> I get excited about that because it, I think it, uh, it is something that the customers don't see yep. that is, in fact, going to allow us to be able to anticipate outages and manage outages better. And so, I mean, our core function is to ensure the, the delivery of safe, reliable, adequate utility service at just and reasonable rates. That technology allows the utility or the, the RTO or the transmission management entity to gather that data <clears throat> much more quickly than they can currently do it. I mean, and, and it's, you know, it's significantly different in how they're going to be able to harness data and then use that to um, increase reliability, to manage outages, to anticipate outages, to, to self-heal. Um, so I think that that is a, a technology that doesn't uh, get as much attention as it And, and you, you made a, a great point, as I recall, that uh, customers often uh, don't really see and appreciate right. the cool stuff that, in fact, is going to improve their, their level of service. Right. And then I think the point was also made, the challenge for all of us to get out and communicate to customers. Yep. Yeah, yeah I, uh, one way to think about it is not so much what technologies, but what are the functions that we're looking for. We, at the Massachusetts DPU, we have no interest in kind of picking particular technologies, but we do want there to be an ability to have uh, customers, whether they be residential or business, to produce their own energy. We want there to be ability to store that energy so it can be used later. We want there to be a, a, some technology that provides a platform where things can be plugged and played in the future that we can't even identify now um, as we start thinking about customers having a much more active role. So those are the kind of functions that we're looking for and we're wanting the utilities and other parts of the private sector to step up and figure out how to solve those functions. Um, so that, and that's happening in the kind of rate discussion that we had in the last panel. But there's another issue that we didn't address, and that is if you look at industry nationally, there's a spend of about 3 to 4 percent of revenue on innovation, pilots, demonstration. In the electric utility industry, it's about 0.2 percent. And you can understand historically why. I think both the utilities and regulators need to think, how can we allow somewhat more risky investments uh, to allow utilities to experiment with new kinds of technologies, new platforms, new uh, kinds of ways of interacting with customers and integrating renewables, et cetera, EVs, et cetera, into the, into the grid. And I think that's something that regulators should be taking on. Uh, and it's not easy because it raises the stakes somewhat. Sure. And, and is that something that, in fact, we can all get to? Because if, if, mm -hmm. the, if the uh, experiment uh, doesn't work, uh, wh what's the value to customers? What's well, you're back to the communications, yeah. right? So there has to be a very honest communication that the pilot's demonstrations are exactly to find out what works and what doesn't work. And sometimes there'll be an investment that shows that the technology that was being explored doesn't work. Well, we've learned a lot then. And I think that regulators, utilities, it's, and politicians have to be able to say, this is something that we tried. It failed. But in that failure, we learned some really important lessons. Yeah. It's, it's refreshing to, to hear a regulator talk about risk taking, because I mean, that's just not what our norm is. We're not 
we're risk averse. We're basically a risk averse industry, but there is a nexus between what you said, and I was in the telecommunications industry starting in 1984, when AT&T was broken up, you were involved in a, in a different way. I think that there is a, uh, a history lesson for us in this industry, and that is that while AT&T was saying, no, you can only use Bell Labs uh, phone equipment for uh, plugging into the system, otherwise the system is going to blow up, many times we have said no, rather than looking at the economics of alternatives to what we provide to see whether or not it would make more sense for our customer to do something, whether it be a tariff change, rate design change, uh, cutting costs even though you know that all you're going to do is reduce costs for your customers and not provide more to the bottom line. You know, again, my experience at FPL, my experience at NB Energy is if your customers are benefited by actions that you take, then your regulator is going to be more likely to give you a better rate of return. So I just look at the, the history lesson that this industry can, can learn from in how the telecommunications industry transformed itself with technology and we have smart meters coupled with changes in renewable energy, PV primarily, costs coming down. Um, we need to be the, the honest broker for our customers because that's what we're in the business to do. Help our customers provide electric service in an affordable way, in the cleanest way possible. They should look to us. But that's going to take some transformation for us as, the way we think, as far as the way we think about our customer. You know, it is Part of the approach then to shift from kind of the binary choice between uh, we provide it or someone else provides it to more opportunities for partnership. I think whenever you have things, and, and I forget who said it on the panel uh, that I was on, um, we've had a tendency to be either risk averse or hugely risk taking um, diversification, internationalization, things that we did that were just not in our sweet spot. But we are averse to working with others in, in some form of partnership. I think we need to explore that because there are a lot of things we don't do well. And if there are others who do things better than we do, but we can keep the customer contact, that's really what we should be all about. Bob, let me, let me pick up on that. So, you know, the way that we've been discussing it is looking at our system as an energy systems integrator where we would be agnostic as to what is deployed on the system. The question is, as you move towards that model, which is not the vertically integrated model, it seems as if the new market entrants are, are positing two different approaches. We heard one this morning from the systems uh, IT kind of methodology, right, where we can take big data and crunch it and maybe bring efficiency to your system. There's the other side of it, which is, and to go back to your first question, we could see with a breakthrough in technology with storage where that's a big game changer, where the customer himself uh, decides, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and use storage and I'm going to use uh, some sort of distributed generation not to deal with my utility. So. That's where the regulatory compact has to come in. That's where we have to have some sort of a dialogue around how that evolves to the extent you either have storage or to the that really is a breakthrough in the next few years or some sort of a, a sterling type of engine that NRG is, is, is pursuing, which is you know, placed through natural gas in and around the home and can, can serve that home or a small neighborhood Dealing with that issue and what, what you do with those costs, which are going to be pushed off on others, is really going to be important. And so the way we, we're looking at it is, how do we integrate this technology in a way that is fair for all customers? Because we still serve all customers at the end of the day. California is looking specifically at storage. We are. Uh, in fact, there's a, a new mandate for 1,300 megawatts of storage not exactly clear about whether it would be capacity, measure on a capacity basis energy, but the, that's not so much the point. Um, I, I think that's probably the uh, conventional answer is that 
storage could be that uh, that holy grail, that thing that really changes uh, dramatically the business. Maybe I'll just use that to springboard to, I guess, a basic philosophy I have, um, which is life is inherently messy, and I think this is going to be inherently messy. Uh, I actually think the regulators may have the toughest job in this program uh, because they have a responsibility to try to bring order and bring fairness to uh, you know to this whole messy process. But uh, you know we're in a difficult position where we're making multi-year investments. I kind of use the general. We always use B's next to the dollar sign for the things that we do. Yet we have to wait for 30, 40, sometimes 50 years for recovery. Um, in the speed of change that we're now experiencing in uh, in society, that's not a good place. So I just assume this will be a very messy process. Uh, it's very difficult to predict where it's going to go. Uh, ultimately, the winners are the ones who are most adaptable, the ones who are able to flex and uh, find ways to um, continue to stay as close to the mission as possible serving customers, and at the same time, since we're investor-owned utilities, we have to do that in a way that provides a fair return to, to our investors. I have no idea where this is going to end up, and I honestly don't think any of my August panel members do either. Uh, but that's, you know, that's our job. Our job is to try to bring some level of order to what's going to be a, a fairly chaotic process and try to do it in a way that ultimately serves our customers we can't stray too far from that, and that allows for a reasonable rate of return. Yeah. I don't think that's going to be a straight line by any means. I think it's going to be fairly chaotic. Which is why I, you know, I do agree that storage is probably the one technology that um, can have the fastest impact. I mean, I don't expect to open up the Wall Street Journal tomorrow and, you know, the, the holy grail has been found on it. But this is an industry that moves very slow. We plan many years in advance, you know, in our state, our utilities come in quite often for rate cases, but I know in some states they come in years and years. And um, so that's why having the discussion now is very important. And also the investments made now, you know, that's, it, it is a hard job because I'm very worried about, I wrote down one of the words I wrote down in one of the earlier panels was stranded costs. Um, so we're doing all these great things and all these new technologies. Well. Are we still going to be able to use the assets that are being paid for right now by the ratepayers and utilities and the investments? So, yeah, it's going to get messy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. f following up on the messiness, and uh, I'm not sure I agree or disagree that regulators have uh, the hardest job, but we certainly have the most fun job. That's, there's no question about that. Um, but part, and this goes to your point too, that part of the messiness is addressed in this rapidly changing time. Uh, with those kind of partnerships that you're talking about. So I think, as I mentioned, um, you know, our utilities were unleashed on energy efficiency. We made it a, a, a good business choice for them to do. But they don't do the actual in-the-home energy stuff. They, they are partnering with all of these new start startups. Opower is one of them. I, I know that they're here. And um, I mean, that has helped. And, and, you know, and it's a flexible system. They will have partnerships. The partnerships will end. Then there'll be new partnerships with new startups, new companies. And I think that'll mitigate some of the messiness, whether it's about energy efficiency, which I'm not sure I mentioned, but Massachusetts is number one, surpassing California. <laughs> Sorry, Ted. Um, or storage, electric vehicles, et cetera. That's I didn't catch that. What, what, what is yeah, that? Number one. <laughs> Sorry. Number one. <laughs> well, yeah. I just want to mention, in the southeast, I, I really don't see our regulators as being risk adverse. Uh, I think that it's a reputation that you develop over time in the utility being able to deliver uh, what they say they're going to deliver. So if you think about it, in Georgia, we're getting ready to build or are in the process of building two nuclear plants, which haven't been done in over 20 years. So it takes a lot of risk and a lot of trust by that regulator to allow us to do that. So I don't believe that they're all risk adverse, but I think that we as a utility have to make sure that we, that we are delivering on those promises uh, that we are or telling them. And to make that investment as the utility uh, or credit or, or equity, you've got to have confidence not just in the regulators who are there at that moment or legislators, right. uh, but those who will be there for decades to That's come. That's right. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, you know, you started out asking what technology. Yes. What you were excited about. I would kind of cycle back to that. And you started out talking about communications. I started out in the telecommunications business too in 1982. And I think, you know, we can't predict the future. But to me, the technology, in a very broad term, that's made any of this possible and that's going to continue <coughs> to make it possible is the communications technology. Whether it's the consumer technology, whether it's the internet, whether it's where that's going, everything's moving to IP and, you know, enabled environment, including basic voice service. Uh, the ability to have, you know, the synchrophasers, Robert, that, and have them communicate, whether it's internal uh, <coughs> communications on the utility system, your SCADA systems, and, and, or the, um, the billing, the, the thermostats. Without that revolution in technology, which has been largely an unwrenched, you know, you got your big AT&T decisions, has been an unregulated, um, huge aspect of, of our economy, that's going to continue to, in many ways, enable. There haven't been that many sort of breakthrough, you know, inventions in the power area. Um, we've got storage, maybe some new battery storage and fuel cells and other things coming. But the stuff that's really been the breakthrough has been at the, t at the communications level, the communications technology. And that's going to continue to evolve. And that's going to continue both drive and enable wherever the electric distribution, the electric generation, because we're always going to, and ironically, of course, that technology to work depends largely on having abundant, reliable electricity ubiquitously available as anybody who's, you know, batteries run out when they're on a phone. Mm -hmm. So um, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, synergism there and um, <coughs> interdependency, but I think it's, it's going to be the communications technology that's going to. I'm going to push back just a little bit on the statement that there hasn't been a lot of innovation. <laughs> I don't think you would probably agree. I think there has been actually extraordinary innovation, but it's been more the Bell Labs kind of innovation on the existing platform, uh, making the network more robust, more efficient. And what you're saying is there's now, on rather the than sustaining, side. but yeah. potentially disruptive innovation as well. Yeah, just to, to add to that, I think the communication technology is uh, clearly important. Um, it's then what you do with that data that you're collecting from the generation, transmission, distribution, and customer engagement that um, um, that's where the value gets added. And it's really um, analyzing that data and looking at it across the demand and the supply side and balancing that. Um, is um, is is a is is where the value really gets added in in uh, in, in, in my opinion, and obviously um, that also requires power <laughs> to do the data crunching and analysis and uh, some fascinating um, you know fascinating work that's happening around machine learning and applications of leading edge uh, computer science to to that whole area. Yeah, Bob. I also would say though I wouldn't belittle the. Um, the breakthroughs that have been done, uh, when I agree communications is critical and using the data, but also even in the generation, what's been done. I mean, you know, go back and look at what has changed even the combined cycle plant. And, you know, the plants we're building now are 6,700 heat rate plants compared to a few years ago where that would have been unheard of. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have the biggest impact to customers, and our customers are very clear to us, reliability first, bills second, and the reality is they want both to be as low, mm -hmm. high, high reliability, low bills. The fuel savings alone for our customers are measured in billions of dollars now uh, every year because of the fuel efficiency of the fleet. That headroom in the bill, if you will, that savings that the customer has experienced now, I think is what gives our regulators as well as us as company executives the ability then to have credibility as well as just economic bandwidth to go out and embrace <coughs> new technologies and try some of these pilot programs because it's not going to raise the bill because you have the ability to actually go and reinvest uh, without having a negative impact on the consumer's pocketbook at the same time. So I think that you, you've got to look at all of the portfolio and say, how can I, uh, as a company and as a regulator, look to drive that value proposition to the customer which then leads to trust, which then leads to the ability to actually be more innovative if you're successful. Well, I'd wanted to open up the discussion a little bit to what will that utility of the future look like? And this is an interesting uh, group to have that discussion with because across the board, 
Uh, every one of the utilities has a little bit different uh, business model, vertically integrated or not, diversified or not, uh, and very much the same uh, on the state side. And then from the technology perspective, you've got experience not just in the United States, but around the world. So uh, what does that uh, utility uh, look like, or what, what, what's the range in that messy, messy future? So, so as a technology guy with a utility background, let me start there, because I have a real fear as I attend these conferences, and I'll, I'll use our industry as what I hope you don't turn into, okay? <laughs> if, if, if today the way you buy software from a company like Oracle would be equivalent to you buying a car from GM and them having them deliver the, the engine separately, the tire separately, the chassis <laughs> separately, dump in your driveway and say, say good luck, put it together. That's how technology is delivered in the business today. And, and when I hear, we also, we describe the utility industry today, Larry Ellison does, and I have strategy meetings with Larry uh, regularly about the utility industry. He's fascinated by it. We call it, it the new lingo in the, in, the, in the utility business today is the SaaS industry, software as a service, right? Basically being able to plug in. The best SaaS type industry in the face of the planet is this industry. All I have to do is take any device I want, plug it in an outlet. I don't care about the wire sitting behind it. I don't care about the plant sitting behind it. I don't care about anything else. I just plug it in and it works. So whatever you do to this business, <laughs> don't lose that, okay? I'm in a business now trying to get to where this industry is, right? We're trying to build a SaaS business that looks like this industry. And I get really scared when I hear a lot of well-intentioned people say, well, now you know we're going to do this to this industry and we're going to do this to this industry. Don't do a lot of that stuff, okay? <laughs> it's a pretty good model now. Does it need to be tweaked for technology? Yes. Is big data coming? Yes. Is there going to be different generation technology guaranteed, different distribution, different transmission, different ways for customers to interact? But you have the perfect SaaS solution on the planet. All customers have to do is plug it in, and we can operate anything from cars now to anything else we want to operate in that business. So whatever you do to it, don't change that model. We're trying to get to where you are, and we're supposed to be a company that knows what's going to happen before anybody else knows what's going to happen. So, so just keep that in the back of your minds, whether you're a regulator, whether you're a utility executive, or whether you're in my business. The model's pretty good. The guys who built this industry from scratch 100 years ago kind of had it right, right? It's a simple SaaS business from a customer perspective. It's the easiest product in the world to use. Is, Don't screw that up. Is it fair to say that one of the things that uh, might, or in some cases has, as you said, screwed it up, be the desire to be neutral, to unbundle, whether for specific policy reasons, for antitrust reasons, and that seems to have been certainly one of the things that was going on in, in, in telecommunications. Yeah, I mean, I, look, shame on us if we don't learn from that telecommunications yeah. model, right? Because what goes around comes around, and that's what happened in the, in the telecom business. We've seen it go almost 360. Yeah. Um, and, and we don't need to go through that process in this industry, in my humble opinion. Um, hmm. and, and I think the way you do that is begin to violate regulatory complex, compacts, get prices way too high, restrict access, to wh whatever you do that's a mistake. I mean, that's, that's how you kind of get in that position. And some utilities have already gotten there, and they're suffering from that today, in my opinion. But just remember, the model that we've got in this industry is, is the best consumer model on the planet. You can't do that with any other product. You can't do it, you know, in the utility industry, you can do it a little bit with water, you can do it a little bit with gas, but the, the electric model is the best consumer model on the planet. You just need to be good caretakers of that model and make sure that you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We'll, we'll take that to heart. Yeah. And I, in, in one respect, I completely agree with Roger, and I think that the point, if, if you've ever traveled to a developing country, you, you get that, right? Yep. You, there's, no, you know, there's no certain availability of electricity for residential use, for businesses, and it stalls economies, right? I, I mean, if you could think about electricity being the lifeblood of economic development and, and you don't have it. So I think that's, that's very true and has been true for the last hundred years, but only when you're talking about on the demand side. So as a demander of electricity, yes. I plug in my thing, I could do any electronic device, that is true. But the new world is one in which the customer now wants to also be engaged on the supply side in a variety of different ways. So it is not a plug and play system the way that you're describing it. If I want storage in my house, or if I want PV on my house, or I want an electric vehicle that not only will drive me to places, but can act as a generator on a hot day when the ISO wants to call on my car to... Yeah, I, think, so I think some customers want that, but I can tell you, I've read global studies, and, and every study I've read would say that's still the minority of customers. 
I, I don't so disagree. Again, I'm just saying don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because there's a lot of upside in that model still. I would say some customers, but most customers want it to be as simple to use as possible. But they want the flexibility in how they use it. But so yeah, the utility sorry, of the future should be able to provide for both of those customers. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. If you just want to plug in, great. So maybe to think about the utility of the future, it's a kind of energy and energy services platform. And that, uh, that's flexible, that is nimble, that can respond to the demands of different kinds of customers. But regulators have to be able to step up and say, we agree that this is the kind of model that we want. No, I think that's right. You know, um, have you ever been to Nevada? <laughs> uh, I have, yeah. <laughs> Would you like to move there? <laughs> I hear it's very warm there. It's a dry warm, but it's nice. Yes. Right. Uh, what's being said is, is really it's fascinating to me because what we have been is a provider of a service to customers, but the only provider of service to that customer. And when I hear the term, and please forgive me, when I hear the term rate payer in my in my company, somebody has to throw a buck into a United Way pot. <laughs> they have to use the term customer. I, and I'm you might steal think that it's, from you. Might think it's simple, you know, or, or it's silly. But if we don't think of our customers as customers who are vulnerable, who are starting, who are going to start to have at least thinking that they have choice. And I say that because there are some uh, unscrupulous out there who are really not telling the true story, similar to what Enron did mm -hmm. in trying to you know, tell, tell everybody how stupid and, and stodgy and slow moving these utilities are and we can do it better faster. I'm not suggesting that the newcomers are like that, but they're certainly not telling the straight story. We have to be, we should be the ones who understand our customers as well as possible and serve them the way they want to be served with a a bundle of offerings, mm -hmm. again, similar to the telecommunications industry, <coughs> where they can say, I can pick and choose. I want this. I want premium rate. I want flat rate. I want time of use rate. I want green rate, what have you. I want DJ on my roof, like I said in the, in the panel. We're not a customer-centric kind of utility in, 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 in general. We have to change the way we think about our customers. It starts with nomenclature. As kind of silly as that might sound, I think that's an important start. And I, I think utilities across the country are really, really emphasizing engaging with the customer in ways that it just simply has not occurred before. And it was great to hear regulators really come at the uh, same subject in the same way. Yeah, Mike, I couldn't agree with you more. And you're, it's not silly. It is absolutely correct that everybody, all the way through the utility, down to the lineman, has to, it's a customer. I completely agree with that. It's also very important to give clear and truthful price signals then to the customers as well. And that's very important from the utility, from the regulators, from legislators, because we all as consumers love optionality and flexibility. There's a price to pay for that, right? And so, you know, the customers are very clear on what they want, at least for us, mm -hmm. and that is reliable and affordable electricity. I mean, I have 4.7 million customers. One quarter of those customers pay less than $50 a month in electric. Okay? So I'm great with giving them additional flexibility, mm -hmm. but the question is, is what, at what cost? And do they really want to do that? Because mm -hmm. you know, one of the things on the, on the solar discussion in our state has been, are those, are those customers the customers who really want to go and spend twenty dollars or $40,000 for an installation mm -hmm. in DG? They may still want mm -hmm. to have the flexibility to say, I want solar in my portfolio, but they may not have the ability to put it on the roof. They may not even have a roof in the way of apartment, mm -hmm. condominium, or mm -hmm. whatever the case is. So I love providing that flexibility and optionality to customers, because I think that's our duty to do so. Um, but our real duty is to serve, and to serve as reliable and affordable as possible. So w there's a tension that's natural in there of the cost to provide that flexibility versus the duty to serve at the most reliable and affordable and clean price possible. I think I'd like to weigh in a yeah. little bit here. Uh, I think the one piece that is a tendency here is to kind of think a little bit in the case of one size fits all, or at least we're very used to socializing very large chunks of cost across a very big base, including across customer classes. Uh, whether that's inside residential, California's got that down pretty well. Lots of, uh, 
lots of variation even amongst residential customers based on usage. But uh, commercial customers are going to think about their electric usage differently than industrial customers, than residential customers, and there are lots of shades of gray in, within each of those. And I think that's actually what's starting to take place. As the technology improves, it's harder and harder for the utility to be a monopoly provider of electricity, and it's harder and harder for that, uh, that cost to be socialized across all those groups and still be fair. And I think that's just inevitable. That pressure is going to continue to build. So at least our view of it at, uh, at Edison is the core role we have is to provide that core infrastructure, the network, if you will, the wires backbone that things can plug and play into. So we really see ourselves more as a facilitator of distributed energy resources and try to do that as efficiently as we possibly can. But outside of that, some customers are going to just want it simple and, and traditional. Uh, some, particularly the bigger the user, the more I think this happens. They are extremely sensitive to price, and it's very easy to chip away at the edges and, ch and peel those customers off from this large socialized uh, cost system. Uh, and that just is inevitable, and that's, what we're, that's where we're seeing the DG go. Uh, and so I think that part is going to continue. At least our view is we'll, we'll manage the energy usage of those customers outside of the regulated model. The regulated model is going to focus on providing the core backbone. Just one other constituent that, I, that I'd add is we talked about the regulator, we've talked about the utility, but there's a whole group, and we spend a lot of time talking to venture capital firms and clean tech industry and that sort of thing, is that group of constituents between the regulatory relationship and the utility want a place where there's reduced risk in making investment. In other words, one of the inhibitors to putting more capital into new technology, new innovation, is risk of putting that in. You don't have the right cooperation between the utility and the regulator, and that you won't have free space to operate. So a lot of the interest in microgrid from innovators is it's separate from that environment, or it could be very separate from that environment, and I'm much more willing to invest into that. And when I think of telecommunications, where all the innovation is was on the new startup, mobile. The wireline's almost dead. It's still the same stuff that was offered in, you know, in the early days, you know, call waiting, I can see a few things, different pricing plans where all the innovations happen is on the mobile side, which was a different platform, different kind of regulatory environment and situations. And I hear a lot of that same kind of discussion um, globally right now in Africa where microgrids are getting very big very quickly. A lot of capital is finding its way there because you can do innovation differently. So that's another constituent I think is worth thinking about. One of the points you're making is, is that by going to that model, you can manage the risks associated with the larger integrated regulatory model. That's right? exactly right. It, a little bit of a correction in terms of telecoms. It's the, the non-regulated or, or the um, disruptive piece is in the last mile, but in That's fact, right. it's a pretty good business for the traditional carriers and an awful lot of investment right. Right. in the upstream network. So I think right. the comparison there is in both cases for the most part, not entirely, you do still need that robust. You do. You have to have the backbone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I uh, didn't uh, allow any time for audience discussion because that's what's going to happen right next door. Uh, this has been a, a great, lively, uh, high energy discussion for so late in the day. Just quickly going down the panel, uh, any last words? You can say sucrophaser one last time. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to yeah. add one one thing, Bob, <laughs> and and that's really it, it's really important to us right now as a company, which is since we are a wires company with only customers as our focus, one of the big things that we are working through is a cultural change. Our, our companies and I think our industry hierarchically were structured in a way in which you didn't have the innovation that the panel that I was moderating talked about. You know there was a decision made at the CEO level or the C level and it was it was pushed down. And I think what we're going to have to face as an industry is how do you allow for innovation to come up from the people on the front lines, from the linemen who may have an idea on a better way to fit more efficiently serve that customer. And that is a major task. I, I want to underline that since you know coming from a service industry where I competed all the time to you know the the culture we have in this industry as well as at the company 
it takes the tone from the top and it takes a lot of work. And it's something we're going to have to continue to work on as an industry. That actually is a great closing comment as far as I'm concerned. I think about infrastructure, tone at the top, but culture. And culture is so incredibly powerful. So thank you for, for that. Uh, we're almost through here. I want to, uh, first of all, thank you all for participating in Powering the People, Next Generation Utility. It really has been an extraordinary day, especially for those of us who are hardy enough to, uh, to stay through to the end. Uh, an, an exciting day of discussion and dialogue. At the end of the year, uh, the Institute uh, will be publishing a book, Next Generation Utility, and uh, that'll be an opportunity to get Lisa's autograph. Uh, if not if not Captain Kirk's. Uh, and this discussion is, is going to be informing that book. And the Institute uh, does intend to keep this discussion going. I think one of the great additions uh, that Lisa and her team have really provided uh, through the Institute to EEI is these early morning roundtables uh, between the technology uh, companies and the utilities. We're all learning a tremendous, uh, tremendous amount uh, from that. I do, uh, again, want to thank all of our event sponsors because we couldn't have done this uh, without them, and they're all uh, with us for the long haul. IBM, Oracle Utilities, C3 Energy, ITRON, uh, First Fuel, O-Power, and Simple Energy. And again, we really couldn't get it done uh, without all of you. So uh, Lisa and TD and Miranda have been cooking all weekend, I bet <laughs> even... Uh, even, even Tom was in the kitchen a little bit helping him out, and I'll do the flight attendant thing. The reception is through that door, and the discussion will continue. Join me in thanking this great group of discussion.